Stir Up Sunday used to be the Sunday next before Advent. At least that's what it's called in the Book of Common Prayer, the Sunday next before Advent, which is to say, actually, the Sunday before the first Sunday in Advent. It was called Stir Up Sunday because the collect for that Sunday began with those words, Stir Up. Stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people, that they, plenteously bringing forth the fruit of good works, may be of thee, be plenteously rewarded through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And people traditionally took it as a reminder to think Christmas pudding and Christmas cake and to begin the process of preparing and seasoning the dry fruit and stirring up the whole mixture so as to have it all prepared and properly aged, ready to eat by Christmas Day. And you can almost taste it. But times change. That famous collect has been transposed and translated to this Sunday, the 15th Sunday after Pentecost or the 14th Sunday after Trinity, brought forward by about 10 weeks. So the collect for today is it. Stir up, O Lord, the wills of your faithful people that richly bearing the fruit of good works, we may by you be richly rewarded through Jesus Christ our Lord. So plenteously bringing and plenteously rewarded are changed to richly bearing and richly rewarded. So it's pretty much the same, but the prayer is still so commanding and so earnest. Stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, stir up, O Lord, that it still sounds to me like an order to get cracking in the kitchen and to begin the process that leads to Christmas. As in, stop flapping around and stop dithering, get your act together, get to work. And it resonates for me. I become anxious because I've wasted so much time this summer that I am embarrassed. My list of things to do is so long that there's a good chance that a lot of them will never get done. And if I spend any more time looking for lost keys, I'll have no time left to lose them. And if I don't light a fire under myself, maybe God will, just as he did to Moses, showing him that burning bush, which I think you read about last week, showing him that burning bush and calling on him to organize the flight from Egypt, the exodus, the great journey to the promised land that began with that collective action of the Passover that we heard described this morning. It was the end of their slavery and the beginning of their freedom, the end of being caught in a rut and the beginning of a great adventure. We might say that God, through Moses, really stirred things up and richly rewarded their good works. And St. Paul in the epistle today is on it too, in the moment. He asks rhetorically, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. So again, skip the quarreling and the petty jealousies and put things in order and focus on what is important. And likewise the gospel, which again is more in the words of its author, St. Matthew, than in the voice of Jesus. It's all about how to resolve arguments in the church in a church that didn't even exist in Jesus' time, but the words are well-intentioned, even wise, and they are attempting to be compassionate, all as a means to resolve friction between people so as to allow them to work together to sustain life in the kingdom of God, to move things forward, whether it's in the kitchen, in the church, in the community, or in our individual lives. And it seems to be especially difficult these days to move anything forward. I guess we all have that sense of moving two steps forward, but then being forced to move three steps back. 
Whether it's shopping for a new shirt or getting the plumbing fixed, every effort seems destined to be impeded by a missing part or a supply chain issue. Nothing seems easy anymore. And it becomes paralyzing because if you worry that it won't get done, you don't bother even to start. So we should remember Moses, who mobilized his nation even though he was certain he was the last man for the job. And we should remember St. Paul, who told us to lay aside the works of darkness, put on the armor of light, and get cracking. We can do this. And Jesus' reminder, or maybe St. Matthew's, don't waste time arguing or quarreling, but save your energy for the important things, including the things that are important to you. So again, taking our cue from the collect, stir up, O Lord, the wills of your faithful people. And we might pray that we make good choices and do the right things. But if we are to make good choices and if we are to do the right things, when we live in an atmosphere that pulls and pushes at our thoughts and persuades us to pay attention to the agenda of influencers or advertisers or governments and allows us hardly any time to think, at least to think for ourselves, we have to find a way to be quiet and patient and prayerful. Moses was quite alone. Beyond the wilderness, it said, when he led his flock of sheep beyond the wilderness to Mount Horeb, and it was there, quite alone, that he met God and found his future. And remember, poor St. Paul, on his private way to Damascus, was struck by a light from heaven that flashed all around him, that knocked him to the ground when he heard that voice. And despite Jesus' promise that he will be there where two or three are gathered in his name, I think, I think he will particularly be there when we are alone, when we take the time to pray one on one, just to be silent and quiet in order to listen. Like Moses, like St. Paul, and then to pray in thanksgiving for the day that is done, and then to pray with purpose for the day to come. And please, don't be afraid to invite God to stir things up 